testing my views here a bit. Arthur Walesley likes to make his appearance. The Duke of Wellington, you know. <coughs> Hello, Alex. I can rock in my chair for a minute or so more. And then we'll start. That seems like a good place to start to me. <clears throat> Chapter 4 of Anne of Avonlea. Quick recap. Uh, yesterday Anne met a new neighbor who had moved in some time ago, but she hadn't really met him before. Mr. Harrison is somewhat cantankerous, one might say, without stretching the truth. And had come over. She met him because he had come over to yell at her about her cow getting into his oats. And then she found out that her friend Priscilla Grant will be teaching the Carmody School, so she'll have another friend nearby. And then she discovered a Jersey cow, very liked at all, in Mr. Harrison's oat field again. Chased it out and promptly sold it, only to discover that it was not, in fact. Daisy, but Mr. Harrison's jersey cow. Huh? So she went over to make that right with cake, and cake being what it is, and Mr. Harrison not being quite as much of a monster as perhaps first impressions might have led her to believe. Um, they made up and made friends. That is often the way that Anne does things. She makes up and makes friends with people. So, there we are. Let's find out what happens today. Chapter 4. Different Opinions. One evening at sunset, Jane Andrews, Gilbert Blythe, and Anne Shirley were lingering by a fence in the shadow of gently swaying spruce boughs, where a woodcut known as the Birch Path joined the main road. Jane had been up to spend the afternoon with Anne, who walked part of the way home with her. At the fence they met Gilbert. And all three were now talking about the fateful morrow, for that morrow was the first of September, and the schools would open. Jane would go to Newbridge and Gilbert to White Sands. You both have the advantage of me, sighed Anne. You're going to teach children who don't know you, but I have to teach my own old schoolmates, and Mrs. Lynde says she's afraid they won't respect me as they would a stranger unless I'm very cross from the first. But I don't believe a teacher should be cross. Oh, it seems to me such a responsibility. Hello, Erin. I guess we'll get on all right, said Jane comfortably. Jane was not troubled by any aspirations to be an influence for good. She meant to earn her salary fairly, please the trustees, and get her name on the school inspector's roll of honor. Further ambitions, Jane had none. 
The main thing to will be to keep order, and the teacher has to be a little cross to do that. If my pupils won't do as I tell them, I shall punish them. How? Give them a good whipping, of course. Oh, Jane, you wouldn't, cried Anne, shocked. Jane, you couldn't. Indeed I could and I would. They deserved it, said Jane decidedly. I could never whip a child, said Anne with equal decision. I don't believe in it at all. Miss Stacy never whipped any of us, and she had perfect order. And Mr. Phillips was always whipping, and he had no order at all. No, if I can't get along without whipping, I shall not try to teach school. There are better ways of managing. I shall try to win my pupils' affections, and then they will want to do what I tell them. But suppose they don't, said Practical Jane. I wouldn't whip them anyhow. I'm sure it wouldn't do any good. Oh, don't whip your pupils, Jane, dear, no matter what they do. What do you think about it, Gilbert? demanded Jane. Don't you think that there are some children who really need a whipping now and then? Don't you think it's a cruel, barbarous thing to whip a child? Any child? exclaimed Anne, her face flushing with earnestness. Yay! Reading and calculus. Hey, Dima! Welcome to the story. Well, said Gilbert slowly, torn between his real convictions and his wish to measure up to Anne's ideal. There's something to be said on both sides. I don't believe in whipping children much. I think, as you say, Anne, that there are better ways of managing as a rule, and that corporal punishment should be a last resort. But on the other hand, as Jane says, I believe there's an occasional child who can't be influenced in any other way, and who, in short, needs a whipping and would be improved by it. Corporal punishment as a last resort is to be my rule. Gilbert, having tried to please both sides, succeeded, as is usual and eminently right, in pleasing neither. Jane tossed her head. I'll whip my pupils when they're naughty. It's the shortest and easiest way of convincing them. Anne gave Gilbert a disappointed glance. I shall never whip a child, she repeated firmly. I feel sure it isn't right or necessary, either. Suppose a boy sauced you back when you told him to do something, said Jane. I keep him in after school and talk kindly and firmly to him, said Anne. There is some good in every person if you can find it. It is a teacher's duty to find and develop it. That's what our old school management professor at Queen's told us, you know. Do you suppose you could find any good in a child by whipping him? It's far more important to influence the children aright than it is even to teach them the three R's, Professor Rennie says. But the inspector examines them in the three R's, mind you, and he won't give you a good report if they don't come up to his standard, protested Jane. I'd rather have my pupils love me and look back to me in after years as a real helper than be on the roll of honor, asserted Anne decidedly. Wouldn't you punish children at all when they misbehaved? asked Gilbert. Oh, yes, I suppose I shall have to, although I know I'll hate to do it. But you can keep them in at recess, or stand them on the floor, or give them lines to write. I suppose you won't punish the girls by making them sit with the boys, said Jane slyly. Gilbert and Anne looked at each other and smiled rather foolishly. Once upon a time, Anne had been made to sit with Gilbert for punishment, and sad and bitter had been the consequences thereof. Well, time will tell which is the best way, said Jane philosophically as they parted. Anne went back to Green Gables by way of the birch path, shadowy, rustling, fern-scented, through violet vale and past Willowmere, where dark and light kissed each other under the firs, and down through Lover's Lane, spots she and Diana had so named long ago. She walked slowly, enjoying the sweetness of wood, and field and the starry summer twilight, and thinking soberly about the new duty she was to take up on the morrow. When she reached the yard at Green Gables, Mrs. Lynde's loud, decided tones floated out through the open kitchen window. Hello, Jacqueline. Mrs. Lynde has come up to give me good advice about tomorrow, thought Anne with a grimace, but I don't believe I'll go in. Her advice is much like pepper, I think, excellent in small quantities, but rather scorching in her doses. I'll run over and have a chat with Mr. Harrison instead. This was not the first time Anne had run over and chatted with Mr. Harrison since the notable affair of the Jersey Cow. She had been there several evenings, and Mr. Harrison and she were very good friends, although there were times and seasons when Anne found the outspokenness on which he prided himself rather trying. Ginger continued to regard her with suspicion 
and never failed to greet her sarcastically as red-headed snippet. Mr. Harrison had tried vainly to break him of the habit by jumping excitedly up and down whenever he saw Anne coming and exclaiming, well, just jumping excitedly up, not up and down, whenever he saw Anne coming and exclaiming, bless my soul, here's that pretty little girl again, or something equally flattering. But Ginger saw through the scheme and scorned it. Anne was never to know how many compliments Mr. Harrison paid her behind her back. He certainly never paid her any to her face. Well, I suppose you've been back in the woods laying in a supply of switches for tomorrow, was his greeting as Anne came up the veranda steps. No, indeed, said Anne indignantly. She was an excellent target for teasing, because she always took things so seriously. I shall never have a switch in my school, Mr. Harrison. Of course, I shall have to have a pointer, but I shall use it for pointing only. So you mean to strap them instead? Well, I don't know, but you're right. A switch stings more at the time, but the strap smarts longer, that's a fact. I shall not use anything of the sort. I'm not going to whip my pupils. Bless my soul, exclaimed Mr. Harrison in genuine astonishment. How do you lay out, lay out to keep order, then? I shall govern by affection, Mr. Harrison. It won't do, said Mr. Harrison. Won't do at all, Anne. Spare the rod and spoil the child. When I went out to school, the master whipped me regular every day, because he said if I wasn't in mischief just then, I was plotting it. Methods have changed since your school days, Mr. Harrison. But human nature hasn't. Mark my words, you'll never manage the young fry unless you keep a rod in, a pickle, in pickle for them. The thing is impossible. Well, I'm going to try my way first, said Anne, who had a fairly strong will of her own and was apt to cling very tenaciously to her theories. You're pretty stubborn, I reckon, was Mr. Harrison's way of putting it. Well, well, we'll see. Some day when you get riled up, and people with hair like yours are desperate apt to get riled, you'll forget all your pretty little notions and give some of them a wailing. You're too young to be teaching anyhow, far too young and childish. Altogether, Anne went to bed that night in a rather pessimistic mood. She slept poorly and was so pale and tragic at breakfast the next morning that Marilla was alarmed and insisted on making her take a cup of scorching ginger tea. Anne sipped it patiently, although she could not imagine what good ginger tea would do. Had it been some magic brew, potent to confer age and experience, Anne would have swallowed a quart of it without flinching. Marilla, what if I fail? You'll hardly fail completely in one day, and there's plenty more days coming, said Marilla. The trouble with you, Anne, is that you'll expect to teach these children everything and reform all their faults right off, and if you can't, you'll think you've failed. Chapter 5 A Full-Fledged Schoolman When Anne reached the school that morning, for the first time in her life she had traversed the birch path deaf and blind to its beauties. All was quiet and still. The preceding teacher had trained the children to be in their places at her arrival. And when Anne, when Anne entered... Blah, 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 blah. And when Anne entered the schoolroom, she was confronted by prim rows of shining morning faces and bright inquisitive eyes. She hung up her hat and faced her pupils, hoping that she did not look as frightened and foolish as she felt, and that they would not perceive how she was trembling. She had sat up until nearly twelve the preceding night, composing a speech she meant to make to her pupils upon opening, its, opening the school. She had revised and improved it painstakingly, and then she had learned it off by heart. It was a very good speech and had some very fine ideas in it, especially about mutual help and earnestly striving after knowledge. The only trouble was that she could not now remember a word of it. After what seemed to her a year, about ten seconds in reality, she said faintly, Take your testaments, please, and sank breathlessly into a chair under cover of the rustle and clatter of the desk lids that followed. While the children read their verses, Anne marshaled her shaky wits into order, and looked up over the array of little pilgrims to the grown-up land. Most of them were, of course, quite well known to her. Her own classmates had passed out in the previous year, preceding year, but the rest had all gone to school with her, excepting the primer class and ten newcomers to Avonlea. Anne secretly felt more interest in these ten than in those whose possibilities were already fairly well mapped out to her. To be sure, they might just be they might be just as commonplace as the rest, 
But on the other hand, there might be a genius among them. It was a thrilling idea. Sitting by himself in a corner at a corner desk with Anthony Pye, he had a dark, sullen little face and was staring at Anne with a hostile expression in his black eyes. Anne instantly made up her mind that she would win that boy's affection and discomfit the Pyes utterly. In the other corner, another strange boy was sitting with Artie Sloan, a jolly-looking little chap with a snub nose, freckled face, and big light blue eyes fringed with whitish lashes. Probably the Donnell boy, and if resemblance went for anything, his sister was sitting across the aisle with Mary Bell. Anne wondered what sort of a mother the child had to send her to school dressed as she was. She wore a faded pink silk dress, trimmed with a great deal of cotton lace, soiled white kid slippers, and silk stockings. Her sandy hair was tortured into innumerable kinky and unnatural curls, surmounted by a flamboyant bow of pink ribbon bigger than her head. Judging from her expression, she was very well satisfied with herself. A pale little thing, with smooth ripples of fine, silky, fawn-colored hair flowing over her shoulders, must, Anne thought, be Annetta Bell, whose parents had formerly lived in the Newbridge school district, but by reason of hauling their house fifty yards north of its old site, were now in Avonlea. Three pallid little girls, crowded into one seat, were certainly cottons, and there was no doubt that the small beauty with the long brown curls and hazel eyes, who was casting her coquettish looks at Jack Gillis over the edge of her testament, was Pretty Rogerson, whose father had recently married a second wife and brought Prilly home from her grandmother's in Grafton. A tall, awkward girl in a back seat, who seemed to have too many feet and hands, and could not place at all, but later on discovered that her name was Barbara Shaw and that she had come to live with an Avonlea aunt. She was also to find that if Barbara ever managed to walk down the aisle without falling over her own or somebody else's feet, the Avonlea scholars wrote the unusual fact up on the porch wall to commemorate it. But when Anne's eyes met those of a boy at the front desk facing her own, a queer little thrill went over her, as if she had found her genius. She knew this must be Paul Irving, and that Mrs. Rachel Lynde had been right for once when she prophesied that he would be unlike the Avonlea children. More than that, Anne realized that he was unlike other children anywhere, and that there was a soul subtly akin to her own gazing at her out of the very dark blue eyes that were watching her so intently. She knew Paul was ten, but he looked no more than eight. He had the most beautiful little face she had ever seen in a child, features of exquisite delicacy and refinement, framed in a halo of chestnut curls. His mouth was delicious, being full without pouting, the crimson lips just softly touching and curving into finely finished little corners that narrowly escaped being dimpled. He, was a, he had a sober, grave, meditative exper expression, as if his spirit was much older than his body. But when Anne smiled softly at him, it vanished in a sudden answering smile, which seemed an illumination of his whole being, as if some lamp had suddenly kindled into flame inside of him, irradiating him from top to toe. Best of all, it was involuntary, born of no external effort or motive, but simply the outflashing of a hidden personality, rare and fine and sweet. With that quick interchange of smiles, Anne and Paul were fast friends forever, before a word had passed between them. The day went by like a dream. Hello, Tyrell. Anne could never clearly recall it afterwards. It almost seemed as if it were not she who was teaching, but someone else. She heard classes and worked sums. Oh, low power mode already. She heard classes and worked sums. Lost my spot. Ah, and set copies mechanically. The children behaved quite well. Only two cases of discipline occurred. Morley Andrews was caught driving a pair of trained crickets in the aisle. and stood Morley on the platform for an hour, and, which Morley felt much more keenly, confiscated his crickets. She put them in a box, and on the way home from school set them free in Violet Vale. But Morley believed, then and ever afterwards, that she took them home and kept them for her own private amusement. The other culprit was Anthony Pye, who poured the last drops from his slate bottle down the back of Aurelia Clay's neck. Anne kept Anthony in at recess and talked to him about what was expected of gentlemen, admonishing him that they never poured water down ladies' necks. She wanted all her boys to be gentlemen, she said. Her little lecture was quite kind and touching, 
But unfortunately, Anthony remained absolutely untouched. He listened to her in silence with the same sullen expression and whistled scornfully as he went out. Anne sighed and then cheered herself up by remembering that winning a pie's affections, like the building of Rome, wasn't the work of a day. In fact, it was doubtful whether some of the pies had any affections to win. But Anne hoped better things of Anthony, who looked as if he might be a rather nice boy, if one ever got behind his sullenness. When school was dismissed and the children had gone, Anne dropped wearily into her chair. Her head ached and she felt woefully discouraged. There was no real reason for discouragement, since nothing very dreadful had occurred. But Anne was very tired and inclined to believe that she would never learn to like teaching, and how terrible it would be to be doing something you didn't like every day for, well, say forty years. Anne was of two minds whether to have her cry out then and there, or to wait until she was safely in her own white room at home. Before she could decide, there was a click of heels and a silken swish on the porch floor, and Anne found herself confronted by a lady whose recent appearance made her recall a recent whose appearance made her recall a recent criticism of Mr. Harrison's on an overdressed female he had seen in a charlatan store. She looked like a head-on collision between a fashion plate and a nightmare. The newcomer was gorgeously arrayed in a pale blue summer silk, puffed, frilled, and shirred wherever puffed, frill, or shirring could possibly be placed. Her head was surmounted by a huge white chiffon hat, bedecked with three long but rather stringy ostrich feathers. A veil of pink chiffon, lavishly sprinkled with huge black dots, hung like a flounce from the hat brim to her shoulders and floated off in two airy streamers behind her. She wore all the jewellery that could be crowded on one small woman, and a very strong odour of perfume attended her. Attended her. I am Mrs. Donnell, Mrs. H. B. Donnell, announced this vision, and I have come in to see you about something Clarice Almira told me when she came home to dinner today. It annoyed me excessively. I'm sorry, faltered Anne, vainly trying to recollect any incident of the morning connected with the Donnell children. With the Donnell children. Clarice Almira told me that you pronounced our name Donnell. Now, Miss Shirley, the correct pronunciation of our name is Donnell, accent on the last syllable. I hope you'll remember this in future. I'll try to, gasped Anne, choking back a wild desire to laugh. I know by experience that it's very unpleasant to have one's name spelled wrong, and I suppose it must be even worse to have it pronounced wrong. Certainly it is, and Clarice Elmira also informed me that you call my son Jacob. He told me that his name was Jacob, protested Anne. I might have expected that, said Mrs. H. B. Donnell, in a tone which implied that gratitude in children was not to be looked for in this degenerate age. That boy has such plebeian tastes, Miss Shirley. When he was born, I wanted to call him St. Clair. It sounds so aristocratic, doesn't it? But his father insisted that he should be called Jacob after his uncle. I yielded because Uncle Jacob was a rich old bachelor. And what do you think, Miss Shirley? When our innocent boy was five years old, Uncle Jacob actually went and got married, and now he has three boys of his own. Did you ever hear of such ingratitude? The moment the invitation to the wedding, for he had the impertinence to send us an invitation, Miss Shirley, came to the house, I said, No more Jacobs for me, thank you. From that day I called my son St. Clair, and St. Clair I am determined he shall be called. His father obstinately continues to call him Jacob, and the boy himself has a perfectly unaccountable preference for the vulgar name. But St. Clair he is and St. Clair he shall remain. You will kindly remember this, Miss Shirley, will you not? Thank you. I told Clarice Elmira that I was sure it was only a misunderstanding, and that a word would set it right. Donnell, accent on the last syllable, and St. Clair, on no account, Jacob. You'll remember? Thank you. When Mrs. H. B. Donnell had skimmed away, Anne locked the school door and went home. 
At the foot of the hill she found Paul Irving by the birch path. He held up to her a cluster of the dainty little wild orchids which Avonlea children called rice lilies. Please, teacher, I found these in Mr. Wright's field, he said shyly, and I came back to give them to you because I thought you were the kind of lady that would like them and because, he lifted his big beautiful eyes, I like you, teacher. You darling, said Anne, taking the fragrant spikes. As if Paul's words had been a spell of magic, discouragement and weariness passed from her spirit, and hope upwelled in her heart like a dancing fountain. She went through the birch path light-footedly, attended by the sweetness of her orchids as by a benediction. Well, how did you get along? Mer <clears throat> well, how did you get along? Marilla wanted to know. Ask me that a month later and I may be able to tell you. I can't now. I don't know myself. I'm too near it. My thoughts feel as if they had been all stirred up until they were thick and muddy. The only thing I feel really sure of having accomplished today is that I taught Cliffy Wright that A is A. He never knew it before. Isn't it something to have started a soul along a path that may end in Shakespeare and Paradise Lost? Mrs. Lynde came up later on with more encouragement. That good lady had waylaid the school children at her gate and demanded of them how they liked their new child, how they liked their new teacher. And every one of them said they liked you splendid, Anne, except Anthony Pye. I must admit he didn't. He said you weren't any good, just like all girl teachers. There's the Pye eleven for you, but never mind. I'm not going to mind, said Anne quietly, and I'm going to make Anthony Pye like me yet. Patience and kindness will surely win him. Well, you never can tell about a pie, said Mrs. Rachel cautiously. They go by contraries, like dreams, often as not. As for that Donnell woman, she'll get no Donnelling from me, I can assure you. The name is Donnell, and always has been. The woman is crazy, that's what. She has a pug dog she calls Queenie, and it has its meals at the table along with the family, eating off a china plate. I'd be afraid of a judgment if I was her. Thomas says Donnell himself is a sensible, hard-working man. But he hadn't much gumption when he picked out a wife, that's what. Chapter 6 That was a fun voice to do. <laughs> All sorts and conditions of men and women. That's all it says. Showing its age again. A September day on Prince Edward Island Hills. A crisp wind blowing up over the sand dunes from the sea. A long red road, winding through fields and woods, now looping itself about a corner of thick-set spruces, now threading a plantation of young maples, maples, with not young maples. We don't want a plantation of maples, thank you. They would object. Now dipping down into a hollow, where a brook flashed out of the woods, and into them again, now basking in open sunshine, between ribbons of goldenrod and smoky blue asters air a thrill with the pipings of myriads of crickets, those glad little pensioners of the summer hills, a plump brown pony ambling along the road, two girls behind him, full to the lips with, with the simple, priceless joy of youth and life. Oh, this is a day left over from Eden, isn't it, Diana? said, and Anne sighed for sheer happiness. The air has magic in it. Look at the purple in the cup of that harvest valley, Diana. And, oh, do smell the dying fir. It's coming up from that little sunny hollow where Mr. Eben Wright has been cutting fence poles. Bliss it is it, bliss is it, on such a day to be alive, but to smell dying fir is very heavy. That's two-thirds word, Wordsworth and one-third Anne Shirley. It doesn't seem possible that there should be dying fir in heaven, does it? And yet it doesn't seem to me that heaven would be quite perfect if you couldn't get a whiff of dead fir as you went through its woods. Perhaps we'll have the odor there without the death. Yes, I think that will be the way. That delicious aroma must be the souls of the firs. And, of course, it will be just souls in heaven. Trees haven't, ha haven't souls, said practical Diana. But the smell of dead fir is certainly lovely. I'm going to make a cushion and fill it with fir needles. You'd better make one too, Anne. I think I shall. And use it for my naps. I'd be certain to dream I was a dryad or a wood nymph then. But just this minute I am well content to be Anne Shirley, Avonlea School, and driving over a road like this on such a sweet, friendly day. It's such a lovely day, but we have anything but a lovely task before us, sighed Diana, 
Why on earth did you offer to canvas this road, Anne? Almost all the cranks in Avonlea live along it, and will probably be treated as if we were begging for ourselves. It's the very worst road of all. That is why I chose it. Of course, Gilbert and Fred would have taken this road if we'd asked them. But you see, Diana, I feel myself responsible for the AVIS, since I was the first one to suggest it, and it seems to me that I ought to do the most disagreeable things. I'm sorry on your account, but you needn't say a word at the cranky places. I'll do all the talking. Mrs. Lynde would say I was well able to. Mrs. Lynde doesn't know whether she doesn't know whether to approve of our enterprise or not. She inclines to when she remembers that Mr. and Mrs. Allen are in favour of it, but the fact that the Village Improvement Societies first originated in the States is a count against it. So she is halting between two opinions, and only success will justify us in Mrs. Lynde's eyes. Priscilla is going to write a paper for our next improvement meeting, and I expect it will be good, for her aunt is such a clever writer, and no doubt it runs in the family. I shall never forget the thrill it gave me when I found out that Mrs. Charlotte E. Morgan was Priscilla's aunt. It seemed so wonderful that I was a friend of the girl whose aunt wrote Edgewood Days and the Rosebud Garden. Where does Mrs. Morgan live? In Toronto. And Priscilla says she's coming to the island for a visit next summer, and if it is possible, Priscilla is going to arrange to have her meet us. That seems almost too good to be true, but it's something pleasant to imagine after you go to bed. The Avonlea Village Improvement Society was an organized fact. Gilbert Blythe was president, Fred Wright vice president, Anne Shirley secretary, and Diana Berry treasurer. Well, why isn't Anne president? Anyway, the improvers, as they were promptly christened, were to meet once a fortnight at the homes of the members. It was admitted that they could not expect to effect many improvements so late in the season, but they man meant to plan the next summer's campaign, collect and discuss ideas, write and read papers, and as Anne said, educate public sentiment generally. There was some disapproval, of course, and, which the improvers felt much more keenly, a good deal of ridicule. Mr. Elisha Wright was reported to have said that a more appropriate name for the organization would be Courting Club. Mrs. Hiram Sloan declared that she had heard the improvers meant to plow up all the roadsides and set them out with geraniums. Mr. Levi Boulter warned his neighbors that the improvers would insist that everybody pull down his house and rebuild it after plans approved by the society. Mr. James Spencer sent them word that he wished they would kindly shovel down the church hill. Even Wright told Anne that he wished the improvers could induce old Josiah Sloan to keep his whiskers trimmed. Mr. Lawrence Bell said he would whitewash his barns if nothing else would please them, but he would not hang lace curtains in his cow stable windows. Mr. Major Spencer asked Clifton Sloan, an improver who drove the milk to the Carmody Cheese Factory, if it was true that everybody would have to have his milk stand hand-painted next summer and keep an embroidered centerpiece on it, in spite of, or perhaps, human sexism, pro eh, sexism almost definitely, alas, in spite of, or perhaps, human nature being what it is, because of, well, my battery's getting low on my phone, so if I die, then I'm on Facebook still, and I will post it later. Uh, hopefully I won't, I've still uh, 20 minutes, we'll see. Come on, phone battery. Human nature being what it is, because of this, the society went gamely to work at the only improvement they could hope to bring about that fall. At the second meeting in the Barry Parlor, Oliver Sloan moved that they start a subscription to re-shingle and paint the hall. Julia Bell seconded it, with an uneasy feeling that she was doing something not exactly ladylike. Julia, you're doing exactly right. You carry on. It's just as ladylike as anything else. Gilbert put the motion. It was carried unanimously, and Anne gravely recorded it in her minutes. The next thing was to appoint a committee, and Gertie Pye, determined not to let Julia Bell carry off all the laurels, boldly moved that Miss Jane Andrews be chairperson of said committee. This motion being also duly seconded and carried, Jane returned the compliment by appointing Gertie on the committee, along with Gilbert, Anne, Diana, and Fred Wright. The committee chose their routes in private conclave. Anne and Diana were told off for the Newbridge Road, Gilbert and Fred for the White Sands Road, and Jane and Gertie for the Carmody Road. 
because Jane explained Bloomer, because explained Gilbert to Anne, as they walked home together through the haunted wood, the pies all live along that road, and they won't give a cent unless one of themselves canvasses them. The next Saturday, Anne and Diana started out. They drove to the end of the road and canvassed homeward, calling first on the Andrews girls. If Catherine is alone, we may get something, said Diana, but if Eliza is there, we won't. Eliza was there, very much so, and looked even grimmer than usual. Miss Eliza was one of those people who give you the impression that life is indeed a veil of tears, and that a smile, never to speak of a laugh, a laugh is a waste of nervous energy truly reprehensible. The Andrews girls had been girls for fifty-odd years, and seemed likely to remain girls to the end of their earthly pilgrimage. Catherine, it was said, had not entirely given up hope, but Eliza, who was born a pessimist, had never had any. They lived in a little brown house, built in a sunny corner, scooped out of Mark Andrews' beech woods. Eliza complained that it was terribly hot in summer, but Catherine was wont to say it was lovely and warm in winter. Eliza was sewing patchwork, not because it was needed, but simply as a protest against the frivolous lace Catherine was crocheting. Eliza listened with a frown and Catherine with a smile, as the girls explained their errand. To be sure, whenever Catherine caught Eliza's eyes, she discarded the smile in guilty confusion, but it crept back the next moment. If I had money to waste, said Eliza grimly, I'd burn it up and have the fun of seeing a blaze, maybe. But I wouldn't give it to that hall, not a cent. It's no benefit to the settlement. Just a place for young folks to meet and carry on when they'd better be home in their beds. Oh, Eliza, young folks must have some amusement, protested Catherine. I don't see the necessity. We didn't gad about to halls and places when we were young, Catherine Andrews. This world is getting worse every day. I think it's getting better, said Catherine firmly. You think? Miss Eliza's voice expressed the utmost contempt. It doesn't signify what you think, Catherine Andrews. Facts is facts. Well, I always like to look on the bright side, Eliza. There isn't any bright side. Oh, indeed there is, cried Anne, who couldn't endure such heresy in silence. Why, there are ever so many bright sides, Miss Andrews. It really is a beautiful world. You won't have such a high opinion of it when you've lived as long in it as I have, retorted Miss Eliza sourly, and you won't be so enthusiastic about improving it either. How's your mother, Diana? Dear me, but she has failed of late. She looks terrible run down. And how long is it before Marilla expects to be stone blind, Anne? The doctor thinks her eyes will not get any worse if she's very careful faltered Anne. Eliza shook her head. Doctors always talk like that just to keep people cheered up. I wouldn't have much hope if I was her. It's better to be prepared for the worst. But oughtn't we to be prepared for the best, too? pleaded Anne. It's just as likely to happen as the worst. Not in my experience, and I've fifty-seven years to set against your sixteen, retorted Eliza. Going, are you? Well, I hope this new society of yours will be able to keep Avonlea from running any further downhill, but I haven't got much hope of it. Anne and Diana got themselves thankfully out and drove away as fast as the fat pony could go. As they rounded the curve below the beechwood, a plump figure came speeding over Mr. Andrews' pasture, waving to them excitedly. It was Catherine Andrews, and she was so out of breath that she could hardly speak, but she thrust a couple of quarters into Anne's hand. That's my contribution to painting the hall, she gasped. I'd like to give you a dollar, but I don't dare take more for my egg money, for Eliza would find it out if I did. I'm real interested in your society, and I believe you're going to do a lot of good. I'm an optimist. I have to be living with Eliza. I must hurry back before she misses, misses me. She thinks I'm feeding the hens. I hope you'll have good luck canvassing, and don't be cast down over what Eliza said. The world is getting better. It certainly is. The next house was Daniel Blair's. Now, it all depends on whether his wife is home or not, said Diana, as they jolted along a deep rutted lane. If she is, we won't get a cent. Everybody says Dan Blair doesn't dare have his hair cut without asking for permission, and it's certain she's very close to state it moderately. But she says she has to be just, just before she's generous. But Mrs. Lynde says she's so much before that generosity never catches up with her at all. 
and related their experience at the Blair place to Marilla that evening. We tied the horse and then rapped at the pantry at the kitchen door. Nobody came, but the door was open and we could hear somebody in the pantry going on dreadfully. We couldn't make out the words, but Diana says she knows they were swearing by the sound of them. I can't believe that of Mr. Blair, for he is always so quiet and meek, but at least he had great provocation. For Marilla, when that poor man came to the door, red as a beet, with perspiration streaming down his face, he had on one of his wife's big gingham aprons. I can't get the, I can't get this darned thing off, he said. Hmm, that's not right. I can't get this darn thing off, he said, for the strings are tied in a hard knot and I can't bust them. So you'll have to excuse me, ladies. We begged him not to mention it and went in and sat down. Mr. Blair sat down too. He twisted the apron around to his back and rolled it up, but he did look so ashamed and worried that I felt sorry for him, and Diana said she feared we had called at an inconvenient time. Poor Mr. Blair, feeling the effects of toxic masculinity. Oh, not at all, said Mr. Blair, trying to smile. You know, he's always very polite. I'm a little busy, getting ready to bake a cake, as it were. My wife got a telegram today that her sister from Montreal is coming tonight, and she's gone to the train to meet her and left orders for me to make a cake for tea. She read out the recipe and told me what to do, but I've clean forgot half the directions already. And it says, flavor according to taste. What does that mean? How can you tell? And what if my taste doesn't happen to be other people's taste? Would a tablespoon of vanilla be enough for a small layer cake? I felt sorrier than ever for the poor man. He didn't seem to be in his proper sphere at all. I had heard of henpecked husbands, and now I felt that I saw one. It was on my lips to say, Mr. Blair, if you'll give us a subscription for the hall, I'll mix up your cake for you. But I suddenly thought it wouldn't be neighborly to drive too sharp a bargain with a fellow creature in distress. So I offered to mix the cake for him without any conditions at all. He just jumped at my offer. He said he'd been used to making his own bread before he was married, but he feared cake was beyond him and yet he hated to disappoint his wife. He got me another apron, and Diana beat the eggs, and I mixed a cake. Mr. Blair ran about and got us the materials. He had forgotten all about his apron, and when he ran, it streamed out behind him, and Diana said she thought she would die to see it. He said he could bake the cake all right. He was used to that. And then he asked for our list, and he put down four dollars. So you see, we were rewarded. But even if he hadn't given a cent, I'd always feel that we had done a truly Christian act in helping him. Horse linen and flavor. <laughs> Definitely to horse taste. I don't know if horses would even like it. Ugh. A bit allergic today. Theodore White's was the next stopping place. Neither Anne nor Diana had ever been there before and they had only a very slight acquaintance with Mrs. Theodore, who was not given to hospitality. Should they go to the back or front door? While they held a whispered consultation, Mrs. Theodore appeared at the front door with an arm full of ne newspapers. Deliberately, she laid them down one by one on the porch floor and the porch steps, and then down the path to the very feet of her mystified collars. Will you please wipe your feet carefully on the grass, and then walk on these papers, she said anxiously. I've just swept the house all over, and I can't have any more dust tracked in. The path's been real muddy since the rain yesterday. Don't you dare laugh, warned Dan in a whisper as they marched along the newspapers. And I implore you, Diana, not to look at me no matter what she says, or I shall not be able to keep a sober face. The papers extended across the hall and into a prim, fleckless parlor. Anne and Diana sat down gingerly on the nearest chairs and explained their errand. Mrs. White heard them politely, interrupting only twice, once to chase out an adventurous fly and once to pick up a tiny wisp of grass that had fallen on the carpet from Anne's dress. Anne felt wretchedly guilty, but Mrs. White subscribed two dollars and paid the money down. To prevent us having to go back for it, Diana said when they got away, Mrs. White had the newspapers gathered up before they had their horse untied, and as they drove out of the yard, they saw her busily wielding a broom in the hall. I've always heard that Mrs. Theodore White was the neatest woman alive, and I'll believe it after this, said Diana, giving way to her suppressed laughter as soon as it was safe. I am glad she has no children, said Anne solemnly. It would be dreadful beyond words for them if she had. 
that the Spencers, Mrs. Ilib Isabella Spencer, made them miserable by saying something ill-natured about everyone in Avonlea. Mr. Thomas Bolter refused to give anything, because the hall, when it had been built, twenty years before, hadn't been built on the site he recommended. Mrs. Esther Bell, who was the picture of health, took half an hour to detail all her aches and pains, and sadly put down fifty cents, because she wouldn't be there that, next, that time next year to do it. No, she would be in her grave. Their worst reception, however, was at Simon Fletcher's. When they drove into the yard, they saw two faces peering at them through the porch window. But although they rapped and waited patiently and persistently, nobody came to the door. Two decidedly ruffled and indignant girls drove away from Simon Fletcher's. Even Anne admitted that she was beginning to feel discouraged. But the tide turned after that. Several Sloan homesteads came next, where they got liberal subscriptions, and from that to the end they fared well, with only an occasional snub. The last place of call was at Robert Dixon's by the Pond Bridge. They stayed to tea here, although they were nearly home, rather than at risk offending Mrs. Dixon, who had the reputation of being a very touchy woman. <laughs> I'm allergic to Mondays. I hear you. Some Mondays. Oh. While they were there, old Mr. Old Mrs. James White called. I've just been down to Lorenzo's, she announced. He's the proudest man in Avonlea this minute. What do you think? There's a brand new boy there, and after seven girls, that's quite an event, I can tell you. Anne pricked up her ears, and when they drove away, she said, I'm going straight to Lorenzo White's. But he lives on the White Sands Road, and it's quite a distance out of our way, protested, protested Diana. Gilbert and Fred will canvass him. They're not going around until next Saturday, and it will be too late by then, said Anne firmly. The novelty will be worn off. Lorenzo White is dreadfully mean, but he will subscribe to anything just now. We mustn't let such a golden opportunity slip, Diana. The result justified Anne's foresight. Mr. White met them in the yard, beaming like the sun upon an Easter day. When Anne asked for a subscription, he agreed enthusiastically. Certain, certain. Just put me down for a dollar more than the highest subscription you've got. That will be five dollars. Mr. Daniel Blair put down four said Anne, half afraid, but Lorenzo did not flinch. Five it is, and here's the money on the spot. Now, I want you to come into the house. There's something in there worth seeing, something very few people have seen as yet. Just come in and pass your opinion. What will we say if the baby isn't pretty? whispered Diana in trepidation, as they followed the excited Lorenzo into the house. Oh, there will certainly be something else nice to say about it, said Anne easily. There always is about a baby. The baby was pretty, however, and Mr. White felt that he got his five dollars worth out of the girl's honest delight over the plump little newcomer. But that was the first, last, and only time that Lorenzo White ever subscribed to anything. Anne, tired as she was, made one more effort for the public wheel, for the public wheel that night, slipping over the fields to interview Mr. Harrison, who was, as usual, smoking his pipe on the veranda with Ginger beside him. Strictly speaking, he was on the Carmody Road, but Jane and Gertie, who were not acquainted with him save by doubtful report, had nervously begged Anne to canvass him. Mr. Harrison, however, flatly refused to subscribe a cent, and all Anne's wiles were in vain. But I thought you approved of our society, Mr. Harrison, she mourned. So I do, so I do, but my approval doesn't go as deep as my pocket, Anne. Few more experiences such as I have had today would make me as much of a pessimist as Miss Eliza Andrews. Anne told her reflection in the East Gable Mirror at bedtime. We have ten more minutes. Let's see. And the next chapter is short, so we'll read it. Chapter 7. The Pointing of Duty Anne leaned back in her chair one mild October evening and sighed. She was sitting at a table covered with textbooks and exercises, but the closely written sheets of paper before her had no apparent connection with studies or school. What's the matter? asked Gilbert, who had arrived at the open kitchen door just in time to hear the sigh. Anne colored and thrust her writing out of sight under some school compositions. Nothing very dreadful. I was just trying to write out some of my thoughts, as Professor Hamilton advised me, but I couldn't get them to please me. They seem so stiff and foolish directly they're written down on white paper with black ink. Fancies are like shadows. You can't cage them. They're such wayward dancing things. 
But perhaps I'll learn the secret some day if I keep on trying. I haven't a great many spare moments, you know. By the time I finished correcting school exercises and compositions, I don't always feel like writing any of my own. You're getting on splendidly in school, Anne. All the children like you, said Gilbert, sitting down on the stone step. No, not at all. Anthony Pye doesn't and won't like me. What is worse, he doesn't respect me. No, he doesn't. He simply holds me in contempt, and I don't mind confessing to you that it worries me miserably. It isn't that he's so very bad. He's only rather mischievous, but no worse than some of the others. He seldom disobeys me, but he obeys with such a scornful air of toleration, as if it wasn't worth while disputing the point, or he would, and it has a bad effect on the others. I've tried every way to win him, but I'm beginning to fear I never shall. I want to, for he's rather a cute lad, if he is a pie, and I could like him if he'd let me. Probably it's merely the effect of what he hears at home. Not altogether. Anthony is an independent little chap and makes up his own mind about things. He's always gone to men before, and he says girl teachers are no good. Well, we'll see what patience and kindness will do. I like overcoming difficulties, and teaching is really very interesting work. Paul Irving makes up for all that is lacking in the others. That child is a perfect darling, Gilbert, and a genius into the bargain. I'm persuaded the word world will hear of him some day, concluded Anne in tones of conviction. I like teaching, too, said Gilbert. It's good training, for one thing. Why, Anne, I've learned more in the weeks I've been teaching the young ideas of White Sands than I learned in all the years I went to school myself. We all seem to be getting on pretty well. The Newbridge people like Jane, I hear, and I think White Sands is tolerably satisfied with your humble servant. All except Mr. Andrew Spencer. I met Mrs. Peter Blewett on my way home last night, and she told me she thought it her duty to inform me that Mr. Spencer didn't approve of my methods. Have you ever noticed, asked Anne reflectively, that when people say it is their duty to tell you a certain thing, you may prepare for something disagreeable? Why is it that they never seem to think it a duty to tell you the pleasant things they hear about you? Mrs. H. B. Darnell called at the school again yesterday and told me she thought it her duty to inform me that Mrs. Harmon Andrews didn't approve of my reading fairy tales to the children and that Mr. Rogerson thought Prilly wasn't coming on fast enough in arithmetic. If Prilly would spend less time making eyes at the boys over her slate, she might do better. I feel quite sure that Jack Gillis works her class sums for her, though I've never been able to catch him red-handed. Have you succeeded in recon reconciling Mrs. Donnell's hopeful son to his saintly name? Yes, laughed Anne, but it was really a difficult task. At first, when I called him St. Clair, he would not take the least notice until I'd spoken two or three times, and then when the other boys nudged him, he would look up with such an aggrieved air as if I'd called him John or Charlie, and he couldn't be expected to know I meant him. So I kept him in after school one night and talked kindly to him. I told him his mother wished me to call him St. Clair, and I couldn't go against her wishes. He saw it when it was all explained out. He's really a very reasonable little fellow, and he said I could call him St. Clair, but that he'd lick the stuffing out of any of the boys that tried it. Of course, I had to rebuke him again for using such shocking language. Since then, I call him St. Clair, and the boys call him Jake, and all goes smoothly. He informs me that he means to be a carpenter, but Mrs. Donnell says I am to make a college professor out of him. The mention of college gave a new direction to Gilbert's thoughts, and they talked for a time of their plans and wishes, gravely, earnestly, hopefully, as youth love to talk, while the future is yet an untrodden path full of wonderful possibilities. Gilbert had finally made up his mind that he was going to be a doctor. It's a splendid profession, he said enthusiastically. A fellow has to fight something all through life. Didn't somebody once define man as a fighting animal? And I want to fight disease and pain and ignorance, which are all members one of another. I want to do my share of honest, real work in the world, Anne, add a little to the sum of human knowledge that all the good men have been accumulating since it began. The folks who lived before me have done so much for me, that I want to show my gratitude by doing something for the folks who will live after me. It seems to me that is the only way a fellow can get square with his obligations to the race. I'd like to add some beauty to life, said Anne dreamily. I don't exactly want to make people know more, though I know that is the noblest ambition, but I'd love to make them have a pleasanter time because of me, 
to have some little joy or happy thought that would never have existed if I hadn't been born. I think you're fulfilling that ambition every day, said Gilbert admiringly. And he was right. Anne was one of the children of light by birthright. After she had passed through a life with a smile or a word thrown across it like a gleam of sunshine, the owner of that life saw it, for the time being at least, as hopeful and lovely and of good report. Finally, Gilbert rose regretfully. Well, I must run up to Macpherson's. Moody Spurgeon came home from Queen's today for Sunday, and he was to bring me a book Professor Boyd is lending me. And I must get Marilla's tea. She went to see Mrs. Keith this evening, and she'll be back soon. Anne had tea ready when Marilla came home. The fire was crackling cheerily, a vase of frost-bleached ferns and ruby-red maple leaves adorned the table, and delectable odors of ham and toast pervaded the air. But Marilla sank into her chair with a deep sigh. "'Are your eyes troubling you? Does your head ache?' queried Anne anxiously. "'No, I'm only tired and worried. It's about Mary and those children. Mary is worse. She can't last much longer. And as for the twins, I don't know what is to become of them. Hasn't their uncle been heard from? Yes, Mary had a letter from him. He's working in a lumber camp and shacking it, whatever that means. Anyway, he says he can't possibly take the children till the spring. He expects to be married. He expects to be married then. Instagram just died. And we'll have a home to take them to. But he says she must get some of the neighbours to keep them for the winter. She says she can't bear to ask any of them. Mary never got on any too well with the East Grafton people, and that's a fact. And the long and short of it is, Anne, that I'm sure Mary wants me to take those children. She didn't say so, but she looked it. Oh, Anne clasped her hands, all a thrill with excitement. And of course you will, Marilla, won't you? I haven't made up my mind, said Marilla rather tartly. I don't rush into things in your headlong way, Anne. Third cousinship is a pretty slim claim. And it will be a fearful responsibility to have two children of six years to look after. Twins at that. Marilla had an idea that twins were just twice as bad as single children. Twins are very interesting. At least one pair of them, said Anne. It's only when there are two or three pairs that it gets monotonous. And I think it would be real nice for you to have something to amuse you when I'm away at school. I don't reckon, I, I don't reckon there'd be much amusement in it. More worry and bother than anything else, I should say. It wouldn't be so risky if they were even as old as you were when I took you. I wouldn't mind Dora so much. She seems good and quiet, but that Davy is a limb. Anne was fond of children, and her heart yearned over the Keith twins. The remembrance of her own neglected childhood was very vivid with her still. She knew that Marilla's only vulnerable point was her... <laughs> her stern devotion to what she believed to be her duty, and Anne skillfully marshaled her arguments along this line. If Davy is naughty, it's all the more reason why she'd have, he should have good training, isn't it, Marilla? If we don't take them, we don't know who will, nor what kind of influences may surround them. Suppose Mrs. Keith's next-door neighbors, the Sprots, were to take them. Mrs. Lynde says Henry Sprott is the most profane man that ever lived, and you can't believe a word his children say. Wouldn't it be dreadful to have the twins learn anything like that? Or suppose they went to the Wiggins. Mrs. Lynde says that Mr. Wiggins sells everything off the plate that can be sold and brings his family up on skim milk. You wouldn't like your relations to be starved, even if they were only third cousins, would you? It seems to me, Marilla, that it is our duty to take them. I suppose it is, assented Marilla gloomily. I dare say I'll tell Mary I'll take them. You needn't look so delighted, Anne. It will mean a good deal of extra work for you. I can't sew a stitch on account of my eyes, so you'll have to see to the making and mending of their clothes, and you don't like sewing. I hate it, said Anne calmly, but if you are willing to take those children from a sense of duty, surely I can do their sewing from a sense of duty. It does people good to have to do things they don't like, in moderation. And that's the end of the chapter. We will continue with chapter 8 tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in, friends. I'm sorry that Instagram died if you were on Instagram and are now on Facebook. I will post this to YouTube shortly. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a wonderful night, and I shall see you tomorrow night at 8.30 for chapter 8.